Well, good morning again and welcome. I'm glad you are here this morning. Let me just share with you before we jump into God's word. Uh, we had our business meeting, our family meeting, we call it, prior to this service. And two things that we announced in that meeting that I want to share with you is two staff changes, I guess, we're making. One is that uh, we, we've asked Grant, who plays electric guitar over here, and Jesse, who's in the drum cage in the back, uh, to co-lead our worship team, to come onto our staff in part-time capacity, and to co-lead our music uh, team up here. So we've done that, and we're excited about where God's uh, taken that team and, and how he's going to use them and grow them and strengthen them uh, to help us worship uh, in a way um, that's honoring to him. So that change is happening. And then the second one is, is that it's been a long time coming, uh, probably 10 years, I think, with, uh, with Pastor Rai and I talking about him becoming full-time. And we're making that move to move him to full-time uh, here at the church. And, and here's how this will play out for him. Um, he's going to give up this hallway here. So fourth grade to diapers will not be his responsibility anymore. Uh, he will, his primary focus will be our junior and senior students uh, that meet in this room here. So fifth through 12th grade, he will oversee and continue to pastor. And then he's taking all of the responsibility of our property, the grounds. We're calling him a building manager. So the responsibilities, the things that I do and, and, and have shared with Sheena um, in the past and and even to a degree now of just maintaining uh, our tenant base, dealing with the issues that happen on a fairly regular basis uh, with the building and, and all that comes with it. So Rye will now oversee all of the property as our building manager, uh, which I'm grateful and thankful to be uh, shifting those responsibilities over to him. And so I ask you to pray for all of those guys as, as they're making these moves uh, to serve God here. And then to pray for us as we seek somebody that would oversee the ministry of our kids because we are very intentional um, about our ministry to kids. We, we, we believe that uh, they're the next generation, and we, they are, and we want them to uh, move and develop and mature from boys and girls uh, to someday be men and women who know, love, and serve Jesus. So we feel like we have a very special part in their development here uh, with their faith, and, and we take it serious. So we, we ask you to join us as we pray for uh, God's provision there with somebody to oversee that ministry that has a passion for kids and seeing them come to know him. So with that, let's move to Colossians chapter one. I'm gonna read to you five verses, five, six verses, 15 through 20. And, and some would argue that this is a poem. They believe it might have been like a hymn of the early church because of the way it's written, the structure of it. There's balance in the words. Uh, but, but what it is, and, and there's debate about whether it is or isn't, but what there's not debate about is that this bit of scripture, these verses, give us a very clear picture of who Jesus is. Uh, this, this idea of, uh, and, and for some of us, this is probably going to stretch uh, what we know about Jesus, um, about who he is and, and you know, when, he, when he came to be and what his role has been um, apart from his earthly ministry. Just that he existed before and he exists after and, and his role in, in what we know and see around us. So just this, uh, this text on the preeminence of Jesus, the centrality um, not only of our lives but in the, the, the created universe all revolves around him and how important it is to us to understand and to know him as a person and the work of his. The thing with Jesus is, for those of us that are believers, he's the great unifier. He's the reason we do what we do. He's the reason we come together like this on a regular basis. He's the reason that we serve and we do things that are uncomfortable and we steward the things that he's trusted us with, our time, our money, our resources, to help other people because we feel like this is what he's telling us to do. When he said, follow me, he meant it. Follow him to do what he's doing, to go where he's going and to serve and to love people that, that, that sometimes is very difficult and uncomfortable. So he's the great unifier for us as believers, but for people who are not believers, right? He, he is the point of division with us. He's the reason they break. They would say that we're not a Christian because 
of our belief in Jesus. I mean, this is the difference between a, a, a Christian, as we would say, we're looking at world religions, and a Jewish person. We, we believe the same Old Testament, but we separate on Jesus. He's what divides. They believe that he was not the Messiah. They're waiting for the Messiah to come. If you ask a Muslim what they think of Jesus, they're not going to deny that he lived. They're not going to deny that, 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 that he was a good teacher. They would say he was a prophet of God, but he wasn't the most important prophet of God. Muhammad was. And Jesus didn't die on the cross. God rescued him from the cross. He didn't actually die. So there's no atonement for sins. He's the divider for that. He's the divider, just the understanding of Jesus with cults, with Mormonism, with Jehovah's Witnesses. This is where we separate. And one of the verses we're going to look at today is one where Jehovah's Witnesses stand on that Jesus is a created being, that he's part of creation. When Paul's writing is going to be very clear that he is not a part of creation, but that he is the creator. So as much as he's the unifier for us, He's a divider to those that reject who he is. So it's important for us, if we're followers of him, or if we're just wondering, is to understand who he is. He wants us to know him. This is why we have this information. This is why he came to planet Earth and lived his life here so that we could see, we could better understand, and then we could follow. So let me read you 15 through 20 of chapter 1, and then we're going to only look at 15, 16, and 17 today. He says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on the earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. Christ is the head of the church, which is the body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we can gather in this place, that we can do it. I'm grateful that we can gather as families today. I pray your word is spoken and that we would receive it, that we would hear it, that we would respond to it, that you would help us to be faithful, that we would have a desire in our heart to know you more, not just intellectually, but that we would grow in our faith, that we would know you and we would love you more and more and more each day. And the evidence of that would be in the lives that we live, that they would bring you honor. So help us to do that. It's in your name I pray, amen. In a postmodern world which we live, we, we can't have absolutes. There is no truth. Truth is what you believe truth to be, and we can't tell somebody else that what they believe is not true. But Jesus is an absolute. And as believers, one of the things that people find hard to believe for us and with us is that we believe Jesus is who he said he is, that he is the way, that there is no other way to be reconciled to God, that if we want to spend eternity in heaven, it's only through him, and they don't like that. They want another way, that, that there's other methods. There can't just be one, that Jesus is exclusive, but at the same time, he's inclusive. His invitation is for all of us. Because he did say, I am the way. I'm the only way. But at the same time, he says, whoever believes in me. And so it's our choice. But this idea of these absolutes, and, and we see them even here in this first chapter of, of, of how strong these statements are. If we go back to verse 6, he says, going out all over the world, bearing fruit everywhere. That this work that God is doing is everywhere. It's all over the world. It's not restricted to a time and a place, a people. It's everywhere. In verse 9, he says, all wisdom and understanding, that God is the one that provides all wisdom. Nobody else can do that. Every good work, every good work, not some good works, not most of the good, all of them, every. 
being strengthened in all his power. That his power is what powers us. Everything, verse 16 said, was created by him. Not just some of the things. Everything through him and for him. Verse 17, before all things, he existed. He holds all creation together. Not some of it. All of it. That he's supreme over all. All the fullness of God. And through him to reconcile all things to himself. Jesus is polarizing. Because he does live in this place of, of extreme. It's all, it's everything. But it's true. And we see this. And for those of us that struggle with it. And, and who he is. And, and, and why is he, did he come. And, and, and how do we respond. He starts in this Verse 15, he says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. And the word for this the image is where we get the word icon from. That, he, that he's an exact representation of him. That he wasn't a representative. He wasn't an ambassador from heaven. Jesus is God. That's how he could be an icon. That's how he could be the visible God, the visible representation to us of an invisible God. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I read about these cathedral. There was a cathedral in Europe that had um, paintings on the ceiling, but the cathedral was narrow and the ceilings were high, but people would come to want to see these paintings and they would look up to, to see them and they would hold that posture because there was so much to view and absorb that they would hurt their necks. People would get cramped up. So somebody in the church decided to bring in large mirrors and they would put the mirrors out and they would just tilt them up enough to see the reflection of the painting. But the people on the ground could just look into the mirror and see what was above. This is, this is what Jesus has done for us. We could see Jesus, look at Jesus, and we see God. He makes the invisible God visible for us. If we ever wonder or question, what is God like? What would God do? All we got to do is go back to the Gospels and just read what Jesus did. Because he's God. He's an exact image of him. And he makes him known that God is not hiding from you and from me. He's revealing himself to us. And this is one of the ways that he did it for us as visible creatures want to see. We have his word that we can spend time in, we can absorb, we can read, we can digest and and it does what only it can do, and that's change us. He wants to be known to you and to I, his creation. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes in verse 4 of chapter 4, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. See, we want to believe, it's easier in our minds to just believe that Jesus showed up at the Christmas story. And then he died and rose again and ascended back to heaven after that. And that's Jesus' story. But it stretches us to understand that, that Jesus was a part of creation. That, that he was there and active in it. He existed before anything was created. And he is over, he is supreme over all of creation. Hebrews chapter one, verse two says, and now in these final days, he has spoken to us, God, through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. And through the son, he created the universe. That Jesus has always been here. And always will be. And we see this in John chapter 1. In his gospel, right at the beginning, he's calling Jesus. He's named him the Word. That Jesus is the Word. He says, in the beginning, the Word already existed. 
The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if we jump to verse 14 of that same chapter, he said, So the Word became flesh. That's John's version of the Christmas story. The Word became flesh and made his home among us. And he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Jesus is the Word, and the Word was God. That's who Jesus is. He makes the invisible God visible to us. In verse 16, he says, and for through, in some translations will say by, by him, God created everything. Everything was created by God. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. But Jesus was active in creation. He is the creator. He's not the creation. In the first verse, in verse 15, in the original language and in many of the other translations, it says that he's the firstborn of creation. So Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, use that verse to say Jesus isn't God. They deny his deity. Because it says in Colossians 1, 15, that he was the firstborn of creation, which means creation started with him. God created him first. But the word firstborn doesn't mean in, in this context, and it was very uh, uh, common, that firstborn meant preeminence. It was priority, not birth order. And there's other examples in the, New Test- or the Old Testament where somebody was called the firstborn, but they actually weren't the firstborn but they were the highest priority. They were the, 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 the son that was going to get the inheritance. But through him and by him, everything was created. In the heavenly realms and on earth, the things we can see, the things we can't see, that he was active in all of it. Part of the heresy that the Colossian church here was dealing with was that there, there was false teaching about angels being mediators between man and God, that we didn't, they didn't, we didn't, they didn't have access directly to God through Jesus, that there were heavenly beings that were above him, and we needed to go to the angels to go to God. So when Paul writes this, he's helping refute that. Well, how can Jesus be under the authority of an, uh, an angel or some, some heavenly being when he created them? That, that, that he was uh, the architect, the designer, and the builder of it all. We see Jesus perform many, many miracles in the Gospels. And people are wondering as, as they witness these things, how does this happen? They do this They're in the recordings. Jesus calms the storm. He stops the wind and the waves. And they go, who is this that he could do this? So you could stop wind and stop waves when you're the one that made them. You could turn water into wine when you've got the original recipe. You did it. You made them. You could cure incurable diseases because you created people. It's all your creation. So of course he's got control over it all. It's his. The visible and the invisible. The microscopic, the things we can barely see, maybe even need tools to, to the cosmic, stuff that's way out there. He created it all, the physical, the spiritual, created the peanut and the planets. And this is how broad his creation is. It tells us how big Jesus is. There's all kinds of data out there and and, and uh, about creation and how big the universe is beyond our scope of really uh, what we're able to comprehend. But one of the ones I remembered was that if the sun was the size of a beach ball and we put it on top of the Empire State Building, the closest star to the sun would be in Australia if the sun was the size of a beach ball. 
Now think about how big the sun is. And how far away then is the closest star to the sun? And God created all of it. Jesus was the creator. He was the creator of the world. Everything we see. Everything we don't see. He was the first word of creation. He'll be the last. He's the creator. He's the finisher. He's the beginning and the end. In Revelation, he said, I'm the alpha and the omega. I'm the beginning and the end. And it was all through him. It was by him, it was through him, and it was for him, creation. One commentator notes that this uh, idea that things were uh, created through him, it means that they remain created, they stand created, that the whole universe rests, that Christ is more important than gravity, that he's outside of that. He's what's holding gravity in place. That everything was created through him. And we see order. He gives this uh, illustration as uh, we believe that he's trying to correct this false teaching. Thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Yeah, in the seen world too, but in the unseen world as well. This isn't chaos. This wasn't just stuff that just happened from a big bang. This was by design, all of it. And it rests on and in him. It says it was for him. Everything was created through him and for him. That creation is a reflection of his glory. And we are the beneficiaries of it. So all of creation is for his glory and for our good. That we get to experience it. And that we get to experience him in creation. That we can see him in the things that are around us. And then in verse 17, he says, he existed, or he is, before anything else. And in him, or in all things, he holds all creation together, all of it. He's the glue that binds everything, that our whole universe is Christ-centered. Not only are, should our lives be Christ-centered, not only should our families be Christ-centered, should our church be Christ-centered, but everything we do, be, but our universe is Christ-centered. Everything we know and see is Christ-centered. It's all built around him. That he is, he is the sustainer. There's nobody greater than him. And that he holds all things together. He was the cause of creation, and he's the bond of creation. If you ask a child, or a child would ask an adult, what keeps the stars from falling out of the sky? We don't have a good answer for this. We'd say, well, there's something holding them together. There's something that keeps them in place. If you asked an astronomer what keeps the stars from falling... They would give the same answer. There's something holding them. We're not really sure what it is, but they're not falling. But there is an answer. It's Jesus, that he's holding it all together. He's sustaining it, all of it. And our science and technology continues to develop and grow. And and, and we've seen that what can happen when we split an atom the smallest particle of our being, that what we are, scientists would tell us, is just a whole bunch of atoms stuck together. Everything is just atoms stuck together. But what keeps the atoms together? They're guessing. They don't know. Even when they describe the process of separating atoms and and nuclear uh, uh, fusion that happens when, when, when they can do that, they still don't fully understand what was keeping it together at all. The force that they're working against. But his word says that Jesus is holding it all together. He sustains it. This isn't like the statue of Atlas with the world on his shoulders trying to hold it up, that Jesus is sustaining the weight of the world. 
literally Jesus is holding everything in his hand. He's sustaining it. It's not bigger than him. He's bigger than creation, all of it. He's the unifying principle for us. He's what brings us together. He's what keeps us together. He's the glue that binds. We can see this easily work itself out in relationships. I often wonder how people who are far from God stay married. Not because I, I, I struggle in my marriage, but it's hard being married sometimes if you're married. Or, is it not? Two people? We talked about this at rehearsal the other night, I think, about there's only one couple I know who are very similar to each other. They're like they married themselves. Like they like the same things. They do the same thing. They have the same. I said, everybody I know married their opposite. I, f- I feel like I married my, what did I say, Jerry? My mortal enemy. I said, I feel like I married my mortal enemy. What, what good graces have you found? Then I said, don't tell Melissa, but now I feel bad. I have to confess. But how do two people who are opposites come together, share a life, maybe reproduce, have some offspring, deal with all the stress that comes with that, trying to manage time and kids and money, and you don't have a bond that's glued together by Jesus? I I don't know how people do it. And the numbers would tell us that many don't. And even those that profess their faith in Jesus struggle with those types of relationships probably because the one that they have with Jesus isn't as strong as they they think it is. If we're not investing in that relationship with him, the relationships around us are gonna suffer. But he's the unifier. He's the one that sustains. He's the one that brings us together. He's the one that keeps us together. There's great confidence in this for us that we don't have to worry about all these things. We don't have to worry. We just know. We don't have to understand everything. There's lots of things we accept without understanding. I don't, I don't know why planes don't fall out. I don't understand that. I just know that when all things work as they should, they go and they come back down. And everybody's happy when they get to where they're going. But I don't understand the mechanics and the, 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 the lift and all of that. I don't need to. I don't need to understand how Jesus is doing all this. I just know that he does. And that he's involved in every aspect of our lives. That as big as God is, he's still very personal. That he cares about all of it. He's involved in all of it. There's no area where Jesus is like, yeah, that's, that's just not my department. I don't cover that stuff. I don't know why you're having issues. I don't know. No, he gets it. He created it all. He's keeping it all together. That verse 17 is really the, the theme for our, our church this year, that Jesus is over all. If we could just keep that where it needs to be, the priority, it's Jesus over all. No matter what it is, It's Jesus first. It's the preeminence of Jesus, that everything stays Jesus-centered. It seems like everything else just works itself out. So what does this mean to us? What what do we take away from this idea that, that Jesus, and why is it important to us that Jesus was at creation? We don't talk about that because we just talk about Jesus showed up at the Christmas story. But he didn't. He told people, they wanted to stone him when he said Abraham, Abraham was excited because he knew Abraham. I'm like, how could you know this? You're not even 50 years old. And he's like, because I am. And he identified himself as God. He said, I am. And they reached for stones to kill him for blasphemy. But Jesus has always been. We just get this glimpse of 33 years of his earthly existence, when he was both man and God. When he lived the life that you and I experienced, he just did it with perfection. 
and then paid the price that you and I deserve on Calvary's cross so that we could be reconciled to God. And he is the only way. So it's important for us to just understand when we're having conversations with people who Jesus really is and what he really does, what he's continuing to do. He wants us to know him. He wants us to trust him, to grow closer to him. He wants us to know who God is. He's the icon, the image of God. He's preeminent over all of creation, all of it, the seen and the unseen. He's the creator of all things. It's all by design. I heard somebody say, you could choose to believe that, that all of creation was through Jesus, or you can believe in a Big Bang theory. Pick your miracle. But we know the truth is that Jesus created it all. And there was a plan and a design behind it. And all things were created by him, through him, and for him. For his glory, for our good. And why is that important? Because he wants us to show us how good he is. And he wants us to worship him. He's given us life for this. I want to read just a couple of verses from Psalm 95 and then I'll close. Because when Jesus is over everything as he should be, I know him more, I doubt less. I trust him more, I worry less. But here's what the psalmist writes. He says, for the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. The depths of the earth are in his hand and the mountain peaks are his. The sea is his, he made it. His hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let's kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the sheep under his care. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. He's big, bigger than our mind can comprehend, but he's personal. And he wants us to know him, and to trust him, and to follow him. And today, and every day, when we hear his voice, don't harden our hearts. Let's go where he's going and do what he's doing and allow him to reveal himself more and more and our faith and our trust grow. Would you pray? Father, we thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. That you love us enough to save us, to fix a problem that we created to reconcile us to a holy and just God, something that we cannot do on our own. That you want to spend eternity with us, but before we get there, you have a plan and a purpose for our life. If we would just listen to you, if we would just trust you, if we would just have faith in you, that we would see the evidence of your fingerprints in our world, in our creation, in our lives, everywhere, all around us. May we hear you, may we respond to you as we should. Lord, help us to have grateful hearts for all that you've done for us. Draw us closer to you and closer to each other. We thank you for your love. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.